Hey, future doctors. Thanks for joining me on Spoonful of Sugar, a podcast made for medical students by medical students to help the medicine go down. My name is Rhea Mulherker. I'm a student at Drexel University College of Medicine, and I will be your host today. If you're wondering how I can spend an entire episode talking just about pulmonary embolism, well, keep listening because you're about to find out. I've decided to dedicate an entire episode to PE because, first of all, it's a very life-threatening condition, and second of all, it's often a very difficult diagnosis to make. The symptoms that it presents with are often very vague, and so they can generate a broad differential. And then there's just tons about the pathophysiology that board examiners love to ask. Given all of that, I'd like to spend some time reviewing with you the causes, presentation, diagnosis, and treatment of pulmonary embolism, and then I'd also like to briefly review uh, some anticoagulation. So to start off, just to make sure everyone's on the same page, what is meant by pulmonary embolism? What exactly is a PE? Anytime something occludes the pulmonary artery, right? And this creates an obstruction to what? Ventilation? Perfusion? It creates an obstruction to perfusion, okay? Because it's blocking the pulmonary artery. So what happens to the VQ ratio or the ventilation perfusion ratio in PE? It becomes high. If the blood flow is obstructed, then Q, which is in the denominator, approaches zero, and VQ actually approaches infinity. We can contrast that to a situation where the airway is obstructed. What happens to the VQ ratio then? Right, it approaches zero because V on the numerator approaches zero. So given what we know about the VQ ratios, does pulmonary embolism improve with administration of oxygen? It does because ventilation is not obstructed. Anytime you have an airway obstruction, that's not going to improve in response to oxygenation. Now, there's a lot of different causes of pulmonary embolism, right? A lot of different materials could essentially obstruct that artery. So I'd like to go through some cases, and we'll start with some of the less common causes of pulmonary embolism before we get to the big one. So let's say a person just sustained bilateral femoral fractures. Uh, What kind of embolism is that person at risk for? A fat embolism, right? Long bone fractures increase your risk of fat embolism. What else increases risk of fat embolism? How about liposuction, right? Sucking all the fat out, that can definitely um, increase risk of getting some fat in the bloodstream. So how do we differentiate someone who has a fat embolism versus a thromboembolism? So some physical findings. Um, In fat embolism, you'll see a petechial rash. Do you guys know why that is? So fat actually breaks up more easily, and so it can go and occlude smaller blood vessels. And so the tiny vessels under the skin can lead to that petechial rash. We can also see this in the brain, you know, uh, the fat can go into tiny vessels in the brain. And do you guys know what MRI finding that corresponds to? It's called star field pattern. So that basically represents multiple micro infarcts that happen in the brain. And so in fat embolism syndrome, we basically see a triad of symptoms and we've gone over them at this point. So if you want to take a minute to think about them, they are hypoxia, petechial rash, and then neurological symptoms. And in terms of treatment for fat embolism, it's really just supportive. So you give these people oxygen and, you know, hope that they get better. Now, what about a pregnant woman who just underwent a vaginal delivery and now she's suddenly hypoxic and hypotensive? She also develops a petechial rash and she starts bleeding out of her IV lines. What's the diagnosis there? So I'm going for amniotic fluid embolism. This is a rare complication that can happen in pregnancy um, and the pathophysiology is not totally understood. It might be some kind of systemic inflammatory response to the amniotic fluid or the fetal parts. Um, but why is this lady bleeding everywhere? So she's in DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation. This is a complication of amniotic fluid embolus. Um, and basically what happens is the fetal material can activate the coagulation cascade. What are some lab values that we see in DIC? Right, everything's pretty much messed up. So we get elevated PT, PTT, elevated D-dimer, low platelets, 
Remember, in DIC, there's disseminated intravascular coagulation, but that actually depletes all of your platelets and clotting factors, and so you get paradoxically increased bleeding. Treatment for amniotic fluid embolism is mainly supportive, but for a patient in DIC, you can try to replete some of their clotting factors. Now, let's talk about a diver. A diver who comes back to the surface too fast. What is he at risk of developing? An air embolism. So this is called decompression sickness, or the bends. It happens in divers. Basically, when they're ascending from the water, there's little gas bubbles that are dissolved in the blood and they can actually come out of solution. And so you get these little nitrogen bubbles that kind of go everywhere and cause emboli. Other causes of embolism that we're probably more likely to see in a hospital, can you think of any? So any invasive procedure that invades the vein, like a central line placement, anything that invades um, the blood circulation, that can create an air embolism as well. And we're definitely more likely to see that in a hospital setting than something like the bends. And then what kind of embolus might we see in an IV drug user? Let's say he comes in with fever, chills, a holosystolic murmur that you hear over the left lower sternal border, and he's complaining of dyspnea, shortness of breath. If you examine him, you hear diffuse crackles over the lungs. What's that? So a septic embolus, or septic emboli usually, um, what I'm describing here is an IV drug user with infective endocarditis, and um, that generally affects the tricuspid valve, remember, because they use IV drugs, and then it goes from the IVC into the right heart, and it usually affects the uh, tricuspid valve, and that can actually send multiple septic emboli into the lungs. Do you guys know the most common pathogen for infective endocarditis in IV drug users? It's Staph aureus. So basically, what we've learned so far is that there's a lot of things that can block the pulmonary arteries and cause pulmonary emboli, right? Fat, air, bacteria, amniotic fluid. But what's the most common thing that usually causes pulmonary embolism? A thrombus, right? A blood clot. So let's talk through a case and then we'll dissect it a little further so we can talk about some risk factors for that. So let's say a 56-year-old woman comes in and she has a history of hypertension and she's telling you she has a two-day history of shortness of breath. She also has this pain on the left side of her chest and it gets worse with inspiration and she works as a truck driver and smokes one and a half packs a day. So when you examine her, she's tachycardic to 110 and she has a BMI of 35. What's the diagnosis here? Well, that's a silly question. We already know it's pulmonary thromboembolism, right? But the point of going through this case was to kind of tell you guys the risk factors for pulmonary thromboembolism. So just in general, what are the risk factors for thrombosis? I hope you're thinking of Virchow's triad, right? What is Virchow's triad? It's a triad of venous stasis, hypercoagulability, and endothelial injury, right? When those three factors come together, you have a very high chance of forming a clot. So in Our Lady, what are some of her risk factors for venous stasis? She's a truck driver, right? And in question stems, you'll often see something that points to a person being sedentary for a long period of time. So some kind of occupation, like a truck driver, maybe they were recently on a very long flight, and oftentimes post-op patients or just hospitalized patients in general, are not mobile, and so they're at risk of venous stasis. Now, what are our patient's risk factors for hypercoagulability? So she's a smoker, that increases coagulation, and she's also obese. So those are her two factors. Other factors that could cause hypercoagulability? So certain genetic things, right, like factor V deficiency or protein C and S deficiency, in nephrotic syndrome, we often lose antithrombin-3 and then become hypercoagulable. And cancer in pregnancy, these are states of hyper hypercoagulability. And pregnancy has to do with the hormones, so oral contraceptives can also increase hypercoagulability. And then, what are our patients' risk factors for endothelial injury? So endothelial injury generally refers to any kind of damage to the surface of the endo. Thelium. So trauma, any kind of foreign material, if there's bacteria or inflammation present. 
Our patient has hypertension, which can also cause trauma and sheer force against the blood vessels. And anything that exposes collagen to the circulating platelets and clotting factors can increase your risk of clotting. So basically, our 56-year-old patient has a perfect storm for a clot to form, right? And the clots that travel to the um, pulmonary vasculature, where do they usually come from? Where do most thrombi originate from? So if you're thinking the leg, deep vein thrombosis, you're absolutely right, but you've got to be more specific than that. So most thrombi originate from the deep femoral vein, okay? DVTs usually occur in the calf. So if you were thinking calf, you were thinking of DVTs, right? They present with pain, swelling, something called Holman sign, which is pain with dorsiflexion of the foot. But the most common deep vein thromboses that lead to pulmonary embolism are in the deep femoral vein. So they're a little bit higher. So let's talk presentation now. Our patient came in, she was short of breath, and she was tachycardic. And these are usually the most common findings in somebody with pulmonary embolism. It's also possible to have a fever. And actually, our patient had this as well. She had some pleuritic chest pain, right? The pain that increased with inspiration. In general, the severity of symptoms depends on how bad the embolus is, right? So if it's a subsegmental embolus and it's a lot deeper in the lung, affecting a smaller part, then the symptoms are going to be much less than, say, if it's a saddle embolus. What is a saddle embolus? It's a huge clot that kind of sits right where the pulmonary artery branches, right? Right as it's going into the left and right sides. And so that obstructs blood flow to both lungs in their entirety. And that's really scary because it can actually present with just sudden death, okay? And I hate to use sudden death as a segue, but if a patient passes away and you're doing an autopsy and you see a clot, how would you know if the clot occurred before they died or after they died? So if you remember from your pathology lectures, um, there's something called the lines of Zahn. These are kind of alternating pink and red lines, right? And do you guys know what these lines represent? So they actually represent fibrin and platelets kind of interdigitating amongst the RBCs. So if they're present, it means that the clot occurred before the patient died because there was time for fibrin and clotting factors to kind of accumulate. If the clot occurred after death, then you won't see the lines of Zahn. And so that's a pathological finding that we can use um, to determine when the clot happened. Of course, we're really hoping that our patient doesn't die on us, right? So we need to kind of work her up if we're suspecting PE. How do we diagnose pulmonary embolism? What's the gold standard diagnostic technique? So the gold standard diagnostic technique for pulmonary embolism is pulmonary angiography. It's where you inject contrast into the vein and you do a CT. But of course, anytime you're injecting contrast, there are certain contraindications, right? So what if a patient is in renal failure or if they're pregnant and you can't do CT angiography? What test could you use then? You can use something called a VQ scan or a ventilation perfusion scan. So what this does is you get both inhaled and IV radionucleotide, and then they can image it to see both ventilation and perfusion. Now, a VQ scan also poses certain risks in pregnancy, but it's definitely preferred over the CT angiogram. Now, this is a little over the step one level, but just so you guys know, clinically, um, we use something called the Wells criteria to determine a patient's risk of pulmonary embolism. And that basically gives us a score. So if the score is low, then we don't actually jump to imaging right away, okay? And there's a certain lab value that we can actually order that would help us rule out thrombosis. Do you guys know what that lab value is? I'm thinking of the D-dimer. And you remember what D-dimer is? It's a fibrin degradation product. So it's basically elevated if there's clotting going on. The thing about D-dimer is that it's almost 100% sensitive, but it's not specific at all. So that means that if it's negative, then it can definitely rule out pulmonary embolism. But if it's elevated, it could be from anything. It could be from thrombosis, but it could also be from pregnancy, malignancy, inflammation, trauma. There's a lot of different things that could be going on. 
So that's why if you have low suspicion, low clinical suspicion that a patient has pulmonary embolism, then you can get a D-dimer to rule it out. If you have high clinical suspicion, then you would want to go for a CTA. The thing with PE is that it's very difficult to diagnose. So you might not even suspect PE right away in a patient who's presenting with particular symptoms. And so although there's a bunch of tests that you wouldn't necessarily order right away if you're suspecting PE, you need to be familiar with some findings that are associated with pulmonary embolism. For example, if you were to look at a patient's arterial blood gas, what would their acid-base status be in pulmonary embolism? So because the patient would probably be hyperventilating, they're going to be in respiratory alkalosis, right? Hyperventilation basically blows off a lot of carbon dioxide. So they're going to be in respiratory alkalosis. Now, what about the EKG? Say the patient comes in with shortness of breath and chest pain. You might get an EKG first because you're suspecting an MI. What would be the most common finding on EKG in a patient with pulmonary embolism? Sinus tachycardia is the correct answer. If you guys were thinking of S1, Q3, T3, that's actually a pretty rare finding. Sometimes in patients with pulmonary embolism, you can see an S wave in lead 1, a Q wave in lead 3, and an inverted T wave in lead 3 as well. And that kind of corresponds to right heart strain. So in a patient who has acute core pulmonale from pulmonary embolism, they might have that finding. Another EKG finding might be new onset right bundle branch block, again, from the increased right heart strain due to the pulmonary embolism. Now, what are some chest x-ray findings in a patient with PE? So you might see pleural effusion uh, from increased pressure in the pulmonary vasculature, um, you might also see something called a Fleschner sign. Do you know what that is? That corresponds to an enlarged pulmonary artery. There's something called the Westermark sign. Do you know what that is? So that kind of corresponds to, it's called regional oligemia. So it basically means there's less blood flow after a certain point, after the point of the embolus. And you can kind of see increased blood more proximally and then decreased blood flow more distally. And the final one I'm going to go over in CXR is something called Hampton's hump. Have you heard of that? So Hampton's hump is a peripheral opacity, um, and it's due to wedge-shaped infarction of the lung. Do you guys know what kind of infarction happens in the lung? Your options are red and white. So in the lung, you usually get red infarction, right, or hemorrhagic infarction. And why is that? It has to do with the lung's dual blood supply, so it gets blood from both bronchial and pulmonary arteries. Organs like the heart and kidney generally undergo white infarction because they don't have that dual blood supply. So it's important to note that most of the findings that I went over just now, they're not really sensitive or specific, and they're very, very rare if they are seen. Of course, rare things in real life have a way of showing up frequently on boards, and so that was kind of my purpose in going over them. Just to reiterate, though, what was the gold standard method for diagnosing PE? Right, CT angiography. So now let's say that you did a CT angiography on our patient and confirmed that she does have a pulmonary embolism. How would we want to treat her? So initially, we definitely want to focus on stabilizing her, right? Give her oxygen for ventilatory support if she's hemodynamically unstable, uh, we might want to give her some pressors if they're needed. Acutely, though, what would we want to give her for anticoagulation? Right? That's kind of the heart of the problem. How do we solve the coagulation? You can generally use um, unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin. If she had renal failure, which one would we prefer? So unfractionated heparin, remember, because the low molecular weight heparin is metabolized by the kidney. So we'd want to give unfractionated heparin in that case. And how does heparin work again? What's its mechanism? Heparin activates antithrombin, okay? So we can give her heparin, low molecular weight heparin, and these are usually given subcutaneously. Are there any oral agents that we might be able to give her? <laughs> 
So there are certain drugs that fall under the class of novel oral anticoagulants, um, NOAC or NOACs, and these are the factor 10A inhibitors. Do you guys remember the names of the factor 10A inhibitors? Rivaroxaban, Apixaban, I remember that they have XA or 10A right in their names. Um, and so I remember that they're factor 10A inhibitors. So yeah, we could definitely give her all of those. And then what about chronically, if we want to prevent someone who's at risk from developing pulmonary embolism? What do we use for them? So you can still definitely use the low molecular weight heparin. You can use the NOAX or the rivaroxaban and apixaban. But what's another drug that we use kind of long term for anticoagulation? Warfarin, right? How does warfarin work? So warfarin inhibits the enzyme vitamin K reductase. And so by preventing that enzyme, it interferes with the whole process where vitamin K gamma carboxylates certain vitamin K dependent factors. And do you guys remember which factors those are? So factors 2, 7, 9, 10 as well as protein C and protein S. And so why do we use warfarin chronically and not acutely? Why wouldn't we just give her warfarin? So warfarin has a slower onset of action because we actually have to wait for the clotting factors that are already pleasant, present in the blood to live out their half-lives. So only after all those clotting factors are degraded can the effects of warfarin actually take place. And so that's why you'll often see people being bridged from heparin to warfarin. So they start both of the drugs at the same time, but after a few days, uh, we can take them off heparin because warfarin is finally therapeutic. And how do we know if warfarin is therapeutic? What parameter do we use? So you'll hear of something called the INR, or the International Normalized Ratio. And what is that INR representing? What value? INR represents PT, or prothrombin time, okay? And prothrombin time corresponds to what? Which pathway in the coagulation cascade? It corresponds to the extrinsic pathway, Right? And since the warfarin affects factor 7, I kind of associate it with the extrinsic pathway. And so that's why we use PT to measure the effect of warfarin. And an adjunct for PT is the INR. You guys know what normal INR is? It's about 1. And then what is generally therapeutic INR? If we're treating someone with PE, what, what do we want their INR to be? generally between two and three, okay? And then since we're kind of talking about warfarin and PT, which parameter does heparin affect between PT and PTT? So heparin affects PTT, and PTT reflects the intrinsic pathway in the coagulation cascade. If you're having a hard time remembering these pathways and the parameters that they affect, there's a mnemonic. So... For PT, think of the T as in tennis. For PTT, think of the TT as in table tennis. And remember that tennis, which has one T, is played outside, and table tennis, which has two T's, is played inside. Now you can remember that PT, or tennis, corresponds to the extrinsic pathway, and PTT, or table tennis, corresponds to the intrinsic pathway. And which one does warfarin affect? That's right, PT, the extrinsic pathway. And which one does heparin affect? That would be PTT, or the intrinsic pathway. Now you have to remember that there are going to be patients who have certain contraindications to anticoagulation, right? What would some contraindications to treatment with heparin or warfarin be? So if they're bleeding, then you don't want to anticoagulate them more, right? So if they have an intracranial bleed, if they have a GI bleed, we can't give them heparin and we can't give them warfarin. So what do we do for these patients? So actually, in patients who have documented deep vein thrombosis and who are contraindicated for anticoagulation, we can actually use something called an IVC filter. So it's actually a filter that's placed in the inferior vena cava, 
and it doesn't prevent clots from forming, it just prevents them from getting into the lungs. This is really a last resort, and we definitely don't want to use it unless we absolutely have to. So patients in hospitals, we said earlier, are always at increased risk of pulmonary embolism, right? A lot of times they're post-op patients, a lot of times they're immobilized for long periods of time. How do we prevent PE in these patients? So in hospitals, we can actually treat all patients with subcutaneous heparin or low-dose, low-molecular weight heparin. And we can also um, place these devices on them. They're called SCDs or sequential compression devices. These kind of mechanically press the legs and they protect against venous stasis. And they've also been shown in studies to actually enhance fibrinolysis. That mechanism isn't exactly understood, but they kind of have a twofold role at preventing thrombosis. And then, of course, in all patients, we encourage ambulation. Um, even if you're just on a long flight, you know, it's always a good idea to get up and walk around to prevent venous stasis. So that brings us to the end of our review on pulmonary embolism. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate you guys listening. I hope that you got something out of that. Um, I hope it helps you with answering practice questions. I also hope that you guys got a little bit of clinical context out of that. The major takeaway I want to give you is that if someone comes in with vague symptoms, tachycardia, tachypnea, shortness of breath, they may or may not have chest pain, you never want to rule out pulmonary embolism right away. You don't have to get a CT angio on every patient that comes in with shortness of breath, but pulmonary embolism is just something that you want to have on your radar in case that is the actual diagnosis. Hopefully you will as you guys move forward and answer practice questions. Um... In the meantime, I wish you good luck with everything, good luck with your studies. If you found this episode helpful, please subscribe to our podcast. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, please log on to our website at spoonfulofsugar.org and you can post them under this episode. As you guys are studying, if you ever have an SOS moment, just remember that Spoonful of Sugar is always here to help the medicine go down.